Welcome to Focus Israel's Christmas special. This week we're broadcasting from Bethlehem. Behind me, you see the Gate of Humility, the entrance to the Church of Nativity. As we told you last week, Focus Israel has been receiving attention in Israeli media lately. I was recently interviewed on Israeli Channel 1's IBA News. Paul, uh, explain if you will, what do you think was behind the Swedish proposal to have Jerusalem declared as both the capital of Palestine and Israel? Well, I think that it must be uh, understood within the context of uh, what's perceived as the, the stalemate in, uh, in the peace negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. And in this situation, people are, are getting restless and they want to see some sort of progress. And they're, they're trying to find solutions uh, in places where they haven't really been looking before. So I think that's the, that's the explanation to, to this rather startling um, decision. Foreign Minister Carl Bildt seemed uh, very determined and I assume was probably a little disappointed with the official uh, or the final uh, reaction of the 27 EU members. But how was the, the public, how was the Swedish public reacting to this? Were they interested at all? That's difficult to assess, but I think that, that uh, most Swedes um, unfortunately don't have a lot of knowledge of, of, of the situation and I, th I think that it's, um, it's as I said, startling, to the, no, no matter how watered down this decision eventually was, that, uh, that 3,000 years of Jewish history was basically thrown out the window uh, for, for 20 years of, of Palestinian propaganda. And m most people in Sweden don't see that. They, they, they don't see that, uh, what, what's really going on here. Relations between uh, Stockholm and Jerusalem have been strained uh, over the last few years. Uh, what do you think is behind that? Well, I'm not sure that there's any correlation between the the article in Aftonbladet in August and and what's going on right now. I think those are two different uh, two two different things, but. But uh, and that article was written by a, a journalist who uh, made the allegation that Israeli soldiers were killing Palestinians and harvesting their organs for transplant. Exactly, uh, but I do think that the article reflects uh, a poisoned climate in Sweden, w and and the reason why such an article could be printed in the first place was because people actually think that. What, what it was what was presented in it was plausible enough people thought that it was plausible and that's why it was eventually published Th the reaction against it were very very strong mind you and that's something that's usually not uh, discussed in Israel but they were very strong uh, against this article and, and the allegations but but at the same time it says something very very disturbing about the the culture in Sweden the the media climate in Sweden uh, which is poison there's no other word for it you operate a, a news slash teaching website in English and Swedish. It's called Focus Israel. Right. How did that come about? Well, it started as a vision of an independent TV producer in Sweden, Hans Lindblad, who wanted to change what I was just talking about, the, the poisoned climate in Sweden. Um, he wanted to do in-depth, uh, honest reporting from Israel to change this. All right. Um, they can uh, follow your work on... Uh, your website www.focusisrael.org Paul Wyden, uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Few things have contributed so much to the poisoned media climate as the allegation that Israeli soldiers deliberately murdered the Palestinian boy Mohammed Aldura on September 30th, 2000 in Gaza. We all remember the terrible images that were broadcast over the whole world nine years ago. A Palestinian man and his son had been caught in the line of fire between Israeli soldiers and armed Palestinians by the Netzarim Junction in Gaza. The boy was then allegedly shot to death by the Israeli soldiers. However, the French media analyst Philippe Carsanty has questioned this. In 2004, you were sued for libel by French Channel 2. What was the background of that story? Uh, nine years ago, on September 30, 2000, France 2, the French public TV, owned by the state, broadcast a news report uh, which went all over the world, which was the death of Mohammed al Dura on live. Uh, it was a little Palestinian kid uh, just crouched behind a, uh, behind a barrel uh, on the wall with his father, and it went all over the world. And uh, later on, some people here in Israel and in America understood that this news report was not accurate 
I found their conclusion very interesting. I went further, investigated further, and in 2002, I came to the conclusion, like them before, that it was a complete stage hoax. It never happened. It was actors playing for the camera. So I published this on media rating that it was staged, and friends who sued me for defamation. You were then convicted, and then you appealed, and the conviction that was overturned. Your friends too hasn't uh, given up. Uh, what's happening now with your case? Well, you know, th you understand that the the case was just a strategy, just to engage in a battle with France too, because France too was just saying, oh, we're not talking to Holocaust deniers, so we're not talking about uh, people who are telling us that uh, Mohammed Aldera is not true. So this was a tactic, and they felt into the, they felt they felt into the trap. But the problem is that now we don't care about the case. You know, what is important is that we have proven with more than a hundred evidence that it's a stage hoax. What I have proven is that on September 30, France 2 faked a news report. In order to see if this is a habit for them, I checked the day after, October 1st, and we can see that they were also faking a news report the day after. Tell us a little bit about the concept Pallywood. Who coined it and what does it refer to? So Richard Landis, an American teacher, uh, developed this, this concept like uh, five or six years ago when he discovered that the Palestinian cameraman, cameraman working for the Western media were filming fake scenes in Gaza and the West Bank in order to demonize Israel. And the worst thing is that the Western journalists working in Jerusalem receiving this material were not checking it and just airing it uh, without, uh, without doing their due diligence to verify the fact that they were receiving. A lot of people don't know the effect of the Aldera case. What happened with, with this news reporter? What was the effect on world opinion? Well, on the world opinion, it happened, it was a year before 9-11. It was just a starting point on the Intifada, and Bin Laden used it to incite before 9-11. It has been used also to justify the beheading of Daniel Pearl, the Wall Street journal, uh, journalist. But it's also been used by uh, most of the Muslim countries in postage stamps, street names, buildings, monuments, posters, everywhere. And it's a picture which incited against Israel, the Jews and the Western world since nine years. And it's becoming now in the Muslim world the most popular figure of the Muslim sufferings uh, committed by Israel and with its complicit uh, the Western world. So I think it's very important just to reveal the truth. You know, Israel is just a regular state. They have an army and they are soldiers, but their soldiers are not trying to kill children for no reason, just for the pleasure of killing. To see the entire interview, log on to our website www.focus-israel.org and click on Features. If Philippe Calsanti is right, and Israeli soldiers don't kill Palestinian children for their own high pleasure, then what is the reality? We decided to interview an IDF soldier to investigate further into the matter. Four, four. Okay. Joel is a 27-year-old Swede and is doing reserve duty on the IDF. Focus Israel meets him in an army base outside of Ramallah on the West Bank, where he and his company are getting ready for duty at a checkpoint. Jag från Malmö och växte upp i ett helt vanligt villaområde i Malmö. Svensk-judisk familj. Vad är skillnaden mellan att vara jude i Israel och jude i Sverige? Skillnaden mellan, först och främst, du behöver inte vara rädd för någonting. Du, med din stolthet kan du visa din judiskhet och du kan leva i princip hur du vill. Inga problem överhuvudtaget om du vill vara sekulär eller eh, religiös. I Sverige har du problem som vanligt. Du kan inte gå med, speciellt i Malmö kan du inte gå med huvudbonad. Eh, eftersom jag är religiös jude så eh, går jag med kippa. Det kan jag inte göra i eh, Malmö till exempel. Jag har aldrig kunnat göra. Eh, Korsor, en annan eh, viktig del i mitt liv. Och eh, det var ju problem i, även i skolan. Även om jag ville redan hålla korsor när jag var yngre så var det problem eftersom skolmaten inte var korsor till exempel. Och, eh, Därför, eh, ja, i Israel så har du inte de här problemen helt enkelt. T eh, 2001 eh, tog, flög jag till Israel och sen dess eh, har jag varit här egentligen. Jag började på kibbutz och pluggade lite på yeshiva och eh, sedan eh, ryckte jag in i militären. Vilket är en del av eh, israeliska livet egentligen. 
Det är en del av livet och om du vill bli accepterad och känna dig i Israel och allt vad som krävs. Och också militären, det är en del av livet här så att det är inga val egentligen utan bara göra det. Har du familj här i Israel också? Ja, jag är gift och jag har två barn, pojke och flicka. Okay. Och hur ofta får du göra repmånad? Eh, repmånad gör jag ungefär en månad eh, om året. Det är först träning en vecka och sen så har vi en månad, eh, så lite mer än en månad egentligen. Eh, då vi gör aktiv tjänst. Eh, som och vad brukar, den, vad brukar den tjänsten gå ut på? Den tjänsten går ut på att eh, egentligen eh, allt möjligt. Det brukar vara checkpoints, det brukar vara patrullering eh, med jipar och... och på vägarna, försvara egentligen folk som bor här och se till så att det, det är lugnt egentligen i området. Är det samma grupp som du gör? Det är samma killar som vi träffas varje år så det, det är ganska kul faktiskt för vi eh, träffas var det kul förutom och allvaret i det hela så är det rätt så kul att komma iväg träffas en gång om året och snacka och det. Hur ser en, t- en typisk dag vid en checkpoint ut? I princip är vi kör långa skift som är, kan vara mellan 8 till 10 timmar där vi eh, egentligen kontrollerar bilar och eh, personer och människor som eh, kör igenom så att eh, försöka hindra egentligen eh, eh, terrorister och andra, eh, andra människor för att eh, störa själva området. Det kan vara att lägga vägbomber eller vad som helst egentligen. Eh, ibland så är det vissa grejer som är mer obagliga än andra. Speciellt nu när man är gift och har barn och man var inte, när jag var 90, 20 när jag gjorde militären, då var, ju, då var det bara jag och ingen annan. Det var min familj såklart, min mamma, och pappa och syskon. Men, men eh, nu, eh, nu har du dina egna barn och det är inte, det är inte lätt alltså. Det är inte lätt. Så jag försöker vara så moralisk som möjligt och ett etiskt som möjligt när jag gör allt, alla mina upptag. Men... Vilka reaktioner får du i Sverige bland familj och vänner till det du gör? Eh, ja. Klart mamma och pappa är inte så glada över det egentligen. Eh, men du har inget val. Eh, svenskar tror jag inte förstår egentligen vad det är vi gör här. Eh, och eh, egentligen får jag inga reaktioner överhuvudtaget. För att jag har inte så många vänner kvar i Sverige idag. Om vi snackar svenska vänner och inte judiska vänner. Judiska vänner förstår ju varför vi gör det. Och vi är inte den enda svensken som är inne en, en månad om året. Utan vi är flera stycken. Eh, så att jag menar, vi har stöd från varandra. Och eh, det, det uppskattas. För jag menar, vem skulle göra det om inte vi gör det? Eh, Vad är det som driver dig och motiverar dig? Ideologi, först och främst. Eh, min, jag, jag är religiös. Jag tror på att vi ska vara här i Israel. Ehm, och det är inte självklart att vi är här. Det är ingen självklarhet och ingen sa att eh, livet skulle vara lätt och eh, eh, lämna allting åt sidan utan det här är en del av livet och det, det, driver, det är det som driver mig. Det, det finns inget annat val. Någon måste göra det. Joel puts on the bulletproof vest and the rest of his equipment. This is a part of everyday life for him and for tens of thousands of other Israelis that do active reserve duty once a year. The responsibility for the defense of the state of Israel is a collective responsibility. In Joel's eyes, I see fatigue, but I also see pride and joy as he hurries to catch up with his comrades that are on their way out of the army base. This is the reality in Israel. My name is Paul Whedon, and that was all from Focus Israel's Christmas special from Bethlehem. See us again next week.